anyway, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to bring you part two of the Orange County Housing Candidate Forum. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hansberg. I'm the Executive Director of People for Housing Orange County. We are a grassroots nonprofit dedicated to advocating for more housing in Orange County across the full spectrum of affordability. We are concerned with homelessness. We are concerned with low income housing and moderate income housing for the service sector workers that live in our communities. And we also know that we need housing at the missing middle market rate level as well. So we really are uh, advocates across the full spectrum. Um, we are part of what's called the YIMBY movement. It stands for Yes in My Backyard. It is in op opposition or as a counter voice to the NIMBY, Not in My Backyard, which oftentimes greets a lot of housing uh, development when it comes forward. And we really see developers as, you know, part of the community of providers that make cities and towns uh, the places that they are. We, we definitely see housing as part of the social infrastructure of a city, the same way that the schools are and the roads are and the water lines are, we all need a place to live. And so um, when we look at developers as providers of that, of that infrastructure, I think that we realize that they really are valuable players. Um, and our job as citizens and as planning commissioners, which I'm a planning commissioner, is to help shape those projects so that they can really um, you know, be an asset to our community and to the families that live there. So that's a little bit about what we advocate for. Um, I want to thank uh, my partners that have brought this, uh, this project that I envisioned with my, my leadership team uh, to fruition, which is um, our counterparts at the Building Industry Association of Orange County, the California Apartment Association, the Orange County Business Council, the South Orange County Economic Coalition, and then in the affordable housing world, I want to thank the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing Developers, the Kennedy Commission, Habitat for Humanity of Orange County, and our political partners, the Orange County Young Democrats and the Orange County Young Republicans. And you, I hope, are very impressed that we have managed to pull together such a great coalition. Uh, it's because all of these groups can agree that we need more housing. That is why we are here. Housing is the issue of our day. And whether you serve a low-income community or you are a political conservative or a liberal, or you are looking to downsize from the home that you have raised your children in, we all need more housing options and opportunities. And that's why we're doing this. We're, we're here to hear from you, our, our perspective and current leaders um, about how you see uh, meeting the need for housing in our communities. So I wanted to, I thank my partner organizations. I wanna thank our event sponsors, which is City Ventures and Rancho La Habra, two wonderful providers of housing, and also Graycom Communications, which does public policy uh, and communications. And lastly, I wanna introduce our two moderators. Um, Brian Kaye is the publisher of Irvine Weekly and Orange County, um, sorry, Irvine Weekly and LA Weekly, and was formerly of the Orange County Register. And um, the second half is gonna be moderated by Ryan A, who's vice president at City Ventures, one of our event sponsors, and is also active with the Building Industry Association. So I am very grateful to them to, for serving as moderators. And I think I will go ahead and turn it over to Brian. Are you ready, Brian? I know you're there. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, cool. I was on mute. So, okay. Uh, new computer, so new Zoom functionality. Uh, thanks okay. everyone for being here. I could go on about myself all night, but in the interest of trying to get to all of you, which is the purpose that we're here, I'm just going to go straight into it so we can get to a bunch of our speakers. Um, Elizabeth, were you going to say something? You look like you were. I was. To I just I realized that I wanted to update everybody. So something we learned from the first, uh, we we did this a week ago for the North Orange County, and one thing we learned was. Uh, that moderating is, is it's an intense experience. It's kind of like a marathon. I mean, it's, it's a sprint, not a marathon. So after the city of Irvine candidates um, have their time to talk, we're going to take like a two minute break and we're going to switch moderators. So Brian will exit and Ryan will enter. And thankfully their names are close enough that if I, as long as I go Ryan, it'll probably be okay. Yeah, I will, I will exit so I can start drinking early. Okay, there you go. Uh, All right. Okay, Thank so we're going to go 
straight, thanks Elizabeth. We're gonna go straight to the city of Costa Mesa and we have one candidate from Costa Mesa City Council District 2, Lauren Gameros, did I say that correctly? Yes, you sure did, Brian, how are you? I'm wonderful, how are you? I'm doing great, it's been a while since we chatted, but uh, we'll have to get together again. Yes, well, welcome to the, uh, the discussion. So can you give a brief two minute introduction about yourself? And, and I can, I can, thank you. So I'm a proud 40 year resident of Costa Mesa. I've raised two kids with my wife in District 2 where I'm, run, where I am running. And I want my kids to be able to afford a home in my community. I've worked my entire life in and around the construction industry as an inspector for the Operating Engineers Local 12, I've personally worked on major infrastructure and development projects, leading teams and training workers. I've seen firsthand what investment and development projects can accomplish for our community by providing good paying construction jobs and beautifying our city. We need to be smart about growth. Some neighborhoods just aren't the right place for new development. However, other parts of my district like the Sobeka area north of the 405 would absorb new housing very well. An example of something I would support is a, pro uh, uh, is a property owner that wants to develop our commercial lot into something mixed use that has both commercial space and residential space, together increasing the value of the land in our city. To avoid nimbyism from our neighbors, I believe community workforce agreements are helpful to create support for projects within our communities with local hire or veteran hire agreements, ensuring that residents benefit from all the new jobs. Tackling homelessness is also a core priority of my campaign, and I'm proud to support the work of United and Hopelessness in the effort to create more permanent supporting housing for our feeble sites. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one quick question for you. Um, you know, for, for many, many years, I think Costa Mesa, especially when I was covering it at the register, um, was a place where you would see a lot of growth and development, different types of development, lots of building, um, in recent years, some people, I'm not at the register anymore, but some people I've heard say that that development has slowed or the types of development that were going up slowed. If you were to be uh, elected to the city council, um, do you have any specific policies that you would advance in terms of um, growing houses of all levels? Yes, actually, that's a good question and I'm glad you bring that up. The first thing I would wanna do is have direct community engagement. I believe that we need to listen to the voice of the community in the area that we live. We need to see how new developments are going to affect the citizens in a positive manner or a negative manner. And we need to look at the cost for these things. Sometimes the costs get out of proportion and when we wanna utilize, you know, say affordable housing, it's, it's kind of difficult when a developer wants to come in and has to spend a million dollars on a EIR report and we don't even, we don't even put it through. So we need to look at what it would take to put the development to get together and how it's gonna affect our community. And when we can bring everybody to the table and agree on one project, we'll be able to have affordable housing in our community. Um, thank you, Lauren, appreciate that very much. Um, our next candidate from the city of Costa Mesa running for a different city council district, District 6, um, we have Jeff Harlan. Jeff, are you there? I am here. Hi, Jeff, why don't you introduce yourself and your approach to housing and development? All right, well, thank you. Good evening, um, I'm Jeff Harlan. I'm a candidate for Costa Mesa City Council District 6. Uh, I'm a 15 year resident of Costa Mesa's East Side where I live with my wife and two teenage daughters. Uh, currently, I'm a land use attorney and urban planner and member of the city's planning commission. Uh, I've served as the vice chair for the past two years. I earned my uh, undergraduate degree in environmental design from the University of Pennsylvania, and I've focused on environmental law at Vermont Law School. Um, nearly 25 years ago, I started my career in public service as an environmental attorney and as a deputy to an LA City Council member. Um, and in that role, I led our office's environmental policy agenda, and I spearheaded the adoption of the city's first green building policy. Um, you know, we have a, a number of crises to deal with here today, um, including a public health pandemic, an economy in desperate need of recovery, and impacts of climate change. Um, but we can't forget that we still have a housing crisis, and that really needs to be addressed at the local level. And it's one of the main reasons that I'm running for office. Uh, Costa Mesa needs to provide significantly more housing opportunities, and we're facing a tremendous number under the arena for the upcoming housing element cycle. So we need to not just plan for new development, but also set the table to make it happen. 
and we need to do this smartly, locating housing, your jobs, encouraging development of what I consider the third places that make communities vibrant and also increasing our mobility options. Um, both as a planning commissioner and a land use attorney representing developers and property owners, I know firsthand the difficulty of getting good housing projects approved in California. Um, at times it's a, it's a bare knuckle fight, but it really doesn't have to be. So I think we need to take a hard look at our zoning codes, our housing elements, and our building processes uh, to facilitate desperately needed housing. And as a Costa Mesa City Council member, I'll be doing all of these things to increase housing production at all levels, especially affordable housing, and champion smart growth and help our city thrive. Um, you mentioned affordable housing, and so I, I have a two-part question. Part one of, for the question for you is, um, any specific policy proposals you have to, to jumpstart some of the things you just suggested in your introductory remarks? And then two, um, you mentioned affordable housing, so how would you deal with some of the negative connotations that are in the minds of many people in the community when you say, quote unquote, affordable housing? Well, I, I think the term affordable housing is, is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, I think it does have that, that negative connotation. I think really what we're talking about attainable housing uh, for, for people at all income levels. Um, and as far as specific strategies, I mean, I, I've worked on several projects where there are density bonus projects where you could obviously get to include affordable housing for some uh, concessions. Um, we haven't really taken advantage of that in Costa Mesa at all, and I'd like to see us, us promote that. Um, inclusionary zoning is also another potential strategy, and that's something that we would need some broad-based support for. Um, but the bottom line is we really just need to increase housing at all levels. I mean, we need more supply, and, and I am a firm believer that the way that we increase the supply and provide um, uh, more buy-right options for developers will ultimately produce more affordable housing options. Like Lauren, I've got kids who I'd like to come back to the city um, after they've hopefully gone away for a bit uh, and, and enjoyed the world and, and have a place to live. And it's really just not available at this moment. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're gonna move over to um, the mayor's race. And there's two candidates running for mayor, both of whom are familiar names that we covered a lot when I was at the register. Uh, we'll start with Katrina Foley. Katrina, are you here? No. Going once, going twice, gone. Okay, Wendy Lease, we are going to you. Nice to see you again. You're on mute still. Okay, there you go. There hi, you. Brian, and hi. hi, Jeff. Hi, Lauren. I haven't had the pleasure to meet you, but um, I've heard about you. Uh, I'm Wendy Lease. I am running for mayor in the city of Costa Mesa. So thank you for inviting me to this forum. And congratulations to on all of your accomplishments and your new chapters. The list was quite long of your accomplishments. I'm a 48 year resident of the great city of Costa Mesa. I raised five kids in this great, great city all grown and I am a single mom and currently I'm an educator teaching young people at College Hospital Costa Mesa. We live the good life in Costa Mesa. Our diversity and eclectic housing stock, cool ocean breezes make Costa Mesa a great place to raise a family, work and play. I know very well the challenges of finding suitable affordable housing. At two points in my life, my kids and I were almost homeless when friends took us in. I was elected to the Newport Mesa School Board in 94 and finished in 2002. I was defeated. Uh, I was elected to the Costa Mesa City Council in 2006 and then I was uh, termed out in 14. Because I want to uh, be mayor because I have a vision for the city's future which includes remembering our past. More affordable housing is part of my vision. Our city was incorporated in 1963. We were called Goat Hill. We are compassionate citizenry and we have a lot of single family, senior housing, SROs, uh, R1, and, and we have a lot of people who live in our mobile home parks. I've met many times in the past with the Costa Mesa Affordable Housing Coalition to understand their goals and I've toured Irvine's supportive housing project, I think it was the, through Jamboree. I'm a member of the Costa Mesa Mobile Home Advisory Committee to advocate for our mobile home residents who live in parks, which are often at risk of being developed, sometimes with little or no regard for the future of the mobile home residents. 
I'm aware of the creation of the city's new housing element to include the 11,729 units from SCAG and which is scheduled for adoption later this year. I look forward to knowing more about the consultant's analysis and recommendations. As mayor, I would continue to collaborate with others to plan and build more housing for our seniors and working class and encourage our residents and stakeholders to be involved in these discussions. And there is a project that was supposed to go in at Fairview Developmental Hospital uh, called Shannon's Market. And that was in the works when I was on the council. It probably goes back to 2006, but with um, th that's kind of up in the air. Anyway, so thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming in now. Um, I'm gonna go ask you both a question. Katrina's back now. So I'm gonna have Katrina do her introductory remarks and then I will start in reverse order with a question to Katrina and then Wendy, you'll go last. So Katrina, please give us some introductory remarks. Thank you, I apologize. I was on another call working with uh, Save Our Youth about um, some concerns about COVID spread within their community. And so we just, uh, that call ran a little late. I'm Katrina Foley, I'm the Costa Mesa's first directly elected mayor. I have been serving on our city council for uh, 12 years. I was a school board member for four. I'm a mom, I'm an attorney, employee rights attorney, a business owner. Um, my husband's a teacher. We have two college age sons. We have four generations living in our home right now and we're building an ADU in our backyard because there is no place for anyone to have housing at a reasonable price. My 93 year old grandmother, 73 year old mother, both widowed recently in the last few years, can't find housing here in our community. So this is a crisis that we're in. We have worked really hard over the last two years with our current council majority to identify housing as a priority. We recently uh, adopted a plan for moving forward with a visioning plan for Costa Mesa so that we can meet all the needs of the community. We also entered into a uh, exclusive negotiating agreement to build housing for seniors at the very low and extremely low rate at um, on 19th Street next to the Senior Center. I'm very excited about that opportunity. I've been working with our Assemblywoman, Cotty Petrie Norris, and the team, uh, uh, Councilmember Marr, to look at housing opportunities at various different types of housing affordabilities for the Fairview Development Center site. Um, and Shannon's Mountain actually is still on the books and that would be part and parcel of this project. Um, we also have a uh, course in the city adopted uh, flexible rules regarding accessory dwelling units and um, I've approved several housing plans over the last couple of years, including the plant on Baker Street and Olson Company's uh, single family home housing that's for the price point about, you know, four to 700,000, depending on uh, which units. So working really hard to uh, address the housing needs of many in our community, move seniors who are living in housing that might be available for others out of those housing units into more affordable housing and opening up those as well as looking at ways to to build um, you know multi-purpose housing and also mixed use retail um, components uh, so that people don't have to drive and 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 they can walk and bike and have all the amenities near their homes so um, in addition to that working on so many other things homelessness we opened our first shelter sustainability um, and also i'm a big advocate of multi-purpose there's so much systems. going on that i'm sure we could go probably all night so um the question i wanted to ask is that as as you because i can't like, see who's speaking can i who's speaking so i can see okay sorry um, oh there so, you are sorry <laughs> oh hi brian now i know why you cut me off <laughs> yeah trying to keep us on our time schedule or elizabeth is going to kill me um, and I'll get to my margaritas later. So um, uh, as you know, as both of you know, most uh, cities in the state are gonna fall below state, uh, state mandated housing needs. Um, and specifically in Costa Mesa, I wonder how you plan to deal with that particular challenge um, given some, some, you know, I'll just call it what it is, ballot box zoning, particular measure Y.
Is that a question for me or for Wendy? It's going to be for both of you, but you can start. We're going in reverse order this time. Oh, okay. So, um, well, that's a, that's a challenge for us. And we've had four years under Measure Y, which both my opponent mayors uh, strongly supported. Um, and um, we, we haven't had a project come forward in the past four years uh, because developers don't want to take the risk of having to go through that process. So we're going to have to, as part of our visioning plan and our housing element, I think address that and have community buy-in for the plan for housing. I think that's our best way to uh, address what has become a very difficult measure for our city. Thank you. And Wendy? Well, um, Katrina's right, and, and I worked um, with my neighbors to pass Measure Y because there was just a rush, a gold rush, in Costa Mesa to just develop without really consideration for the neighbors and for traffic infrastructure, um, just for design. It was just um, kind of, it, it was excessive. And so the reaction from the community was to put some to kind of rein it in for future developers but i think and development but i think um with the housing crisis with the arena numbers being eleven thousand seven hundred twenty nine, um i think we have to come together as a community and um just collaborate on where uh suitable projects would be i don't see us undoing measure y but that is always possible because it would be up to the voters to do that so there may be a campaign eventually i think there there are areas and as um, we're going to be looking at the uh, new housing element and, and the visioning that katrina mentioned that um i think it, it's it, the work is out there to do to to find housing and make a commitment, but to, to have it planful and not just haphazard. Great, thanks Thanks to you both and thanks to all four candidates who are running um, in Costa Mesa. I know there are more than that, but the four of you that joined us tonight. Um, now we're gonna bounce over to Dana Point and we have a candidate for Dana Point City Council District 5, Ben Tyler, is it Baby? Baby? Baby. 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 Damn it. Yes. All right. Yes, well, sir. Thanks for joining us. That's all right. What's in a name? <clears throat> <laughs> uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking time from your busy schedules to meet virtually with me today. I'm honored just to be nominated for Dana Point City Council and now to be considered for your support and votes as well. Uh, my name is Benjamin Tyler Beebe. I'm a son, brother, father, partner, scholar, tradesman, and leader. I relocated to Southern California over a decade ago. I have a strong connection to the region, specifically Capistrano Beach. I'm very grateful to be able to raise my children here and proud to call it home. Uh, I've worked managing restaurants up and down the coast from San Diego to Los Angeles, leading diverse teams, of wonderfully talented individuals, and I'm excited for a new opportunity to grow personally and professionally while affecting positive change in our community. I'm running for city council as I feel that is where I can be of maximum service to our city. Uh, I look forward to hearing your concerns, answering your questions, and hopefully serving Orange County as the Dana Point District 5 Capistrano Beach representative for the next four years. Uh, re regarding fiscal responsibility, I'll think outside the box to find ways to help balance our city budget during the economic downturn created by the coronavirus pandemic. I have several create creative ideas on how we can best meet the needs of a growing community while remaining true to our relaxed SoCal roots and I'm running for the purpose of furthering my constituents agenda. Uh, I'd like to faithfully and humbly serve my constituency as the voice on Dana Point City Council. I think that focusing on beach restoration as an avenue to meet the need for missing middle housing via work live spaces, which I heard mentioned earlier, would be an excellent place to start. I'm also proud to be endorsed by the Orange County Professional Firefighters Association as of this afternoon. So thank you for taking time for me this evening. Thank you, thank you. So you mentioned um, kind of middle level housing, but let's talk a little bit about entry level housing. So how would you, if elected, encourage and support entry level homeownership opportunities in Dana Point? 
How would I support entry level homeowner opportunities? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, partnering with local and state uh, legislators as well as business uh, professionals would be a, a, a great way to get some projects started to address these issues. Uh, I think that now is a great time to act uh, with, with the current economic climate. Uh, there's going to be competitive bids for projects out there, and it's just a matter of putting in the time and effort to get out there and find partnerships. Um, and and if, if, that's, if that's by creating avenues for people to get connected to the funding, um, I'll work for that avenue as well as, like I said, finding partnerships to, to start the developments. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to jump away from uh, the city of Dana Point and we're going to go down, or I guess up, because we'd be going north if we're uh, driving, to Huntington Beach, uh, where we have two candidates. Uh, and the first uh, is Emery Hansen. Yes, no, maybe so. Hold on, hold on. I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Um, Hello, my name, it's good to see you, Professor Kaye. Thank you, Professor Kaye. <laughs> my name is Mr. Amory Hansen. I'm a candidate for councilman in 2020, a member and a member of the Huntington Beach Historic Resources Board. I'm speaking today from my apartment, number 8102 Ellis Avenue, apartment 121, and I encourage a vote for Mr. Amory Hansen, number five on the ballot for Huntington Beach City Council, a historic choice. Thanks. That is a that is a very brief introduction. One of my mentors once told me you can never be both bad and brief. Um, <laughs> and since the Chapman semester started, and you called me Professor Kai, I feel special today. Um, so um, just uh, you know, Huntington Beach is obviously one of the iconic cities in uh, Orange County. Um, do you think your city would benefit from multifamily townhome or apartment style living? And would you support all styles of housing products, including multifamily housing, townhomes, apartments, and condos, as a means to help your city meet state mandated goals for housing? Well, my position is that we are benefiting, I guess is the way I would say it. I don't want to say we should or don't benefit, but I do think we are benefiting. Uh, I personally reside in a multifamily uh, apartment uh, complex, um, and I think we do need. I don't really think we need more development for single family or apartments. We're running low on land. And so it is difficult to say that I think that we need more, but I do think, um, but I do think we need to really start recognizing um, ways of providing affordable housing um, besides development. Uh, one idea I've personally come up with is to cr is to create a Section 8 um, housing program because as working at the Orange County Register, you probably know the Orange County system right now is just a complete uh, disaster. They, they, do, they do not um, have anyone le room left on the list. So I think creating a city program uh, similar to that could be beneficial for Huntington Beach. Well, thank you so much. And then we have one other candidate from the city of Huntington Beach, um, Dan Kalmick. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for, uh, for taking part in this forum. My name is Dan Kalmick. I'm one of the other 14 candidates uh, that aren't here uh, for city council in Huntington Beach. We're not large city, uh, fourth largest city in the county, 22nd largest in the state and we run at large. So um, I've lived in the community for my entire life. I bought my house in Huntington Beach 15 years ago, where I now reside with my wife and 15 month old daughter, uh, which is, uh, she may come crashing in here at any time. So I do apologize if that happens. Um, I've been on our planning commission for the last eight years. Prior to that, I was on our mobile home advisory board. So I've got a lot of land use experience, um, worked through our general plan update, uh, worked through, I think, three variations of our housing element, and one of your co-sponsors is a litigant against the city of Huntington Beach in its uh, uh, quest to try to avoid building housing. Um, this all started really uh, with the Beach Edinger Corridor specific plan in Huntington Beach about 10 years ago, which is now, I think, an outdated plan for our city uh, to try to meet our arena numbers. And uh, we had about five buildings get built real quick, uh, 2,000 units in a city of roughly between, you know, arguably between 16 and 80,000 units total. Um, 
And that basically brought the torches and pitchforks out. So we put the brakes on development. We didn't go as far as Costa Mesa. Um, and the Kennedy Commission ended up suing us uh, for that. Uh, I voted to uh, make some amendments, but still say stay legal uh, in order to kind of slow down and have the conversation again. Seven years later, we've barely even had that conversation yet. Um, we are, I got an email from a previous planning commissioner's son saying that uh, don't build any more housing in Huntington Beach, we're overcrowded. And I think that that is the example of the cognitive dissonance we have to overcome in Huntington Beach is that we are overcrowded because we're underhoused. Uh, we've got multi-generational households, I think as uh, Katrina spoke about, um, that used to be cultural and now are economic. And it's something that we really need to uh, focus on in Huntington Beach to look at what's not a six story, 5,000 unit apartment complex, uh, but what's, what are townhomes? You know, as a planning commission, I've supported Olson Company's uh, really interesting townhome modality, um, gets 15, 16 units on a very small parcel, uh, still feels open. I voted for Pacific City, which is a high density project, but it was actually just to kind of fix it from what it was before. And then one other project in our Beach Engineer Corridor specific plan. But I voted to deny bad projects. Our code tends to, tends to implement these bad projects when we have bad form-based code that don't really reflect what our community wants. So, uh, you know, my goal as a planning commissioner and then eventually a city council member come November is to try to listen to what our community has to say, take the good ideas that are coming out of the community and those that are operating in good faith uh, and try to integrate those into the projects coming forward. Uh, eventually, come next year, we're going to have to update our general plan and our specific plan um, for our housing element, obviously, but for our specific plan on Beach Boulevard to figure out what, what housing looks like in Huntington Beach and what folks are willing to uh, embrace. Um, you know, a lot of our folks at my house is the last house we should have yeah, built, but we got to move on that. Because, um, no problem. Because I got to give each person two minutes, or we're going to get behind schedule, and Elizabeth is going to kill me. So um, you mentioned uh, kind of in passing, just kind of some vo voices, and you used an example of voices who are opponents to new housing in the city, which is often, you know, a small group of passionate individuals, but doesn't necessarily represent the views of the entire city. Um, how would you, or what strategies um, will you use to assure all proposed developments are given fair consideration? So I try to meet with as many folks as possible um, and, and talk with as many folks as possible. We have a lot of keyboard warriors in Huntington Beach um, that will post as much as they can on the internet. Um, and I try to follow you know, Costa Mesa's model, which is the first time somebody hears about a project, it shouldn't be on Facebook. Um, and you know, talking with uh, some of the new council members there on how they get their homeless shelter built or how they do, um, how do they get creative things put forward is that they were out there knocking doors in the neighborhood so that they had and handing people business cards to talk about the project before it gets there. Um, you know, we, we definitely, we want to maintain that our property rights owners, uh, our property rights um, are maintained, but we also want to make sure that there's a community benefit. So uh, making sure that we have community benefits for larger projects coming back out to the community, and then also um, taking into account what the residents, um, what the residents want, but, you know, maintaining that concept of property rights as well. Thank you so much. All right, so we're going to jump from Huntington Beach to what I view as the happiest city on earth because I live here, I own property here, and I own a business here, which is the city of Irvine. Um, and to, fortunately, I have some notes on the five, six candidates that we have from Irvine. I'm intimately knowledgeable about this race, so I know two of these candidates are running for mayor and two are running, or four are running for city council. And then there's like two others running for mayor and probably like 14 other <laughs> running for council that are not here. But we'll start with, um, seated city councilwoman Farrah Khan, who is running for mayor of Irvine. Hi, Farrah. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Give us your introductory remarks. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. You know, it's so important. Um, we're living in some very interesting times right now, and we're faced with a pandemic, which has led to economic uncertainty for so many. And with this economic uncertainty comes the issue of housing. We already have a shortage when it comes to subsidized, affordable, attainable, missing middle housing. But moving forward, it'll be critical that we make sure people are not pushed out of those homes because of the inability to pay back their deferred payments on top of their rent or mortgages. Um, we just want to make sure that that doesn't happen. And in Irvine, we need leadership that is looking ahead, not looking behind. Um, leadership that's going to take initiative and lead not wait for um, others to take action or, or take action when it's safe or popular. I remember many times being upset with weak politicians and speaking up at council meetings before I was elected. 
And that's really where I began my journey into public office. And I'll share a little bit about myself. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm a graduate of UC Davis. I'm a mother of two boys that are now 16 and 18. Um, I was elected to the Irvine City Council in 2018. Um, I, along with my husband, have run our small business, a restaurant and catering company, for the past 15 years, surviving not only the recession, but now also COVID-19. Um, prior to that, I served eight years as a regulatory affairs manager for a biotech company and four years as the executive director for a local nonprofit. And I currently sit on the board of the Irvine Community Land Trust and was on the committee with um, the United Way um, in their efforts to end homelessness. Today I'm running for mayor because we need leadership that is not only stable, but that is ready to take on the challenges of tomorrow. Uh, one that has built relationships across the aisle, understands technological advancement, and isn't afraid to take on hard votes. Our city is amazing on so many levels, but there's definitely room for improvement. We're also a city that's growing, and I look forward to making sure that growth addresses the housing issues we're facing. So I'm ready to build sustainability into our economy, environment, housing, and health. And I look forward to discussing more with you at this forum. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to, um, we're going to come back to you. We're going to get a question to you in a second. I'm going to have um, the other candidate that we have on the call for running for mayor, um, Louis Manuel Wong, um, give his introductory remarks. Okay. How's it going, Brian? Good. How are you? Yeah, uh, we're going to chat, right? You'll, you'll give me a call later? Um, we, well, my reporter will, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm doing that because I am introducing myself to everyone in Orange County because this is not an Irvine issue. This is not a Costa Mesa only issue. This is a housing crisis. Uh, and if you don't realize that, I'm sorry. I mean, good, good, good for you. You know, you, you must be doing pretty well. Uh, because I am out here and I am talking to uh, my friends. I'm talking to my friends and they're not even uh, specifically from Irvine. People are reaching out to me because they know I see them and I hear them. I went to a rally. I'm not going to get too political about it, but it was a BLM rally. And guess what? There was a lady there from a college student, 22 years old, she was telling me and everyone in attendance that she was eating bread. She was eating bread for a month because her rent was too much. She cannot afford her rent. So I am, I am hearing these stories and uh, really it's hitting me. So listen, everyone who's listening to this right now, Prop 15, if you're not in favor of Prop 15, you don't give a F right, let me excuse my uh, uh, French, if you don't give a about real people because Prop 15 not only will fund every city government, every local agency, it will also fund, we have a huge defi deficit in, you know, beyond everything we can imagine. Prop 15 will fix it by taxing fairly commercial developers. So, I mean, good luck if you're friends with commercial owners because they must be giving you money, a lot of money in your campaign. I'm not taking a dime from anyone. So I am Prop 15 and that's, that's the number one issue if you want to fix a lot of problems. Number one issue. Number two, ready for this? Renters' Rights Commission. I talked about it time and time again. Renters' Rights Commission because apartment owners are, are, are bad people. They're out to screw people out of the security deposit, the rent deposit. No one likes apartment owners. And I know, Brian, oh, my time is up. Go ahead. <laughs> you saw me turn on my video. So I'm going to start with a question to you. Um, and I might ask a couple because it's Irvine and this is my last city. Um, but I, I, Ir Irvine is known for being uh, America's kind of planned community for its development, for its real estate industry. Um, if you were on the city council, would you continue to support um, sustainable growth in the city of Irvine? That's you, yeah. Are you there? Louis, are you not on mute? Okay, sorry, there was a, something popped up and it forced me to mute. Okay, two minutes start now. Uh, so, thank you for that. Uh, I, know exa I knew exactly you, you, you were going uh, before you uh, asked your question. 
Yes, it's simple supply and demand. I am a socialist running that actually believes in some capitalism. Let's bring some capitalism, let's bring some Adam Smith uh, 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 supply and demand here. I'm, I haven't used any profanity, I said F word. <laughs> uh, uh, let's use some, uh, uh, some pure competition. Let's stop, I'm gonna ask my planning commissioners and I'm gonna encourage everyone in every city, stop having large developers if you have a if you have a plot a large plot of land that is going to be valued at a hundred million dollars, well, you're limiting a lot of other developers. Break it up, break it up into five million dollar parcels, ten million dollar parcels. Guess what? That's going to mean more small businesses instead of the largest co co contractors. You can have the mom and pop contractors do small developments. So break up the developments. Stop having the largest de developers have have a have a uncapitalistic, un monopolistic approach at it. Let's bring some capitalism, put some competition, and guess what? You're gonna solve a lot of problems. You're gonna, you know, supply and demand. Supply and demand. More supply, you're gonna, the rent is gonna be less, and everything's gonna be a, a lot better than the housing crisis that we have right now. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I'm gonna ask the same question to you. You know the history of Irvine. It's uh, a city that was, it's known for its real estate. It's known for being a planned community. How do you and how would you support sustained development, sustainable development uh, in the city of Irvine? Absolutely, that's, that's the best approach to take in our city. And um, really, if you look back at the votes that I've taken in the past, when developers have come in asking for more entitlements and, and more housing, I'm the only one that's speaking up and asking them whether they're gonna build workforce housing, whether they're going to continue um, you know, providing affordable housing and what kind of um, opportunities are out there. There's a lot of opportunities for developers to pick and choose different varieties of homes um, based on size and the technique that they use for building them um, to provide for the various people that are out there. We've got people that are looking for affordable homes, people that are just looking for a, a middle um, you know, range home and now, yes, we have people that want those multi-million dollar homes, but that's, you know, we need to make sure our portfolio is just as diverse as our community is. Awesome. Okay, thanks to you both. We're going to move over to the Irvine uh, City Council race. We have four candidates running for City Council. There's more than that running, but four who are with us this evening. I'll have each of you do your two minutes or less uh, introduction of yourselves, and then I'll ask a question to all of you. So we'll start with you, uh, Christina Dilliard. I'm sorry, guys. I'm kind of sick. I've had strep throat for the past uh, week, two weeks. It seems like all sicknesses are hitting a little hard right now. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I love how you pronounce my name. I feel so fancy, Dilliard. Oh, thank you. That made me feel good. It's Dillard, though. Thank you. Um, so I'm Christina Dillard. I'm 24. I'm a single mom of color and I'm running for Irvine City Council because I wanna be the change that I expect other people to be. I wanna be the change that I'm asking for. Now, when we talk about the housing crisis, I think of more than just a roof over my head. I think of all the things that go with housing and living somewhere and living within a city. I think of transportation, I think of you know jobs, I think of traffic, I think of a lot of different things. So when we talk about housing, how can we really make housing better here in Irvine? And how can we be an example for every city to come? Um, Irvine has always prided itself on being one of the greatest cities, one of the best, one of the leading cities in everything. So why can't we do this with our housing? Um, there are real problems. Um, and it's not just an Irvine problem, you know, it is a statewide crisis and it's, you know, it's not something we can do alone, but together we can make something so beautiful. And that's what I'm working for. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. Um, as far as going in, <clears throat> into details about, you know, what to expect, you know, I feel like we got to all come together to get these answers. No, there's no one perfect person to have these one perfect answers. But, you know, I think I have some really great ideas and some amazing, you know, innovative thinking to add to this. And I just, I'm really excited and I'm really thankful that you guys have allowed me to be here today. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, now we'll go to Diana Jung. Diana, did I pronounce that correctly or incorrectly? Are you here? Let me yes, listen. I'm here. Oh, Hi. Wonderful. Hi, how are you, Brian? Oh, good, good, thanks for asking, how are you? Good. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. 
My name is Diana Jiang. Irvine is one of the safest cities in America. It's one of the reasons most of us moved here. I'm running for city council to keep it that way. Our state has a housing shortage and they want the cities to solve it. Irvine already has the highest number of uh, affordable units in the county. The state says we need to do more and we should for two good reasons. Without some entry level housing, our own kids won't be able to live in the city in which they were raised. Without the next tier of our workforce housing, our teachers, nurses, firefighters, and the police cannot live in the community they protect. It will be a shame if we cannot fix that problem. The challenge is to solve these needs and still preserve our neighborhoods, property values, and quality of life. I am an engineer who likes to plan carefully and thoroughly I execute plans thoughtfully. That means amber public input, creative problem solving, sensitivity to neighboring uses and the real community consensus. There's no easy answers. I do not support turning single family neighborhoods into ocean of the triplexes. I do think we can do more to streamline the permitting process for projects that conform to our plan. I think the state should share part of their sales tax as an incentive for cities that meet the housing goals. Changes in our city should complement, not disrupt our careful planning. I am Diana Jiang. I'm a businesswoman with a strong background in technology. I am trained to find optimal solutions to complicated solutions to benefit most of the people. I'm dedicated to serving the people of Irvine and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll move over to uh, who is our next candidate, Lauren Johnson Norris. Hi, Brian. And hi, Elizabeth. How are you guys? Hi, hi. Good, good. Thanks for asking. Hope you're doing well up in Yosemite. We're jealous. Thanks. Thanks so much. So I'm Lauren Johnson Norris. I'm a mother of twin seven year old girls and an attorney, a small business owner, and an Irvine Community Services Commissioner. I've worked advising the council on affordable housing, active and public transportation, and protecting our open spaces. I moved to Irvine in 2004, and I settled here for the excellent quality of life, award-winning schools, and the safety Irvine has to offer. But I'll share with you that of the 16 years I've lived here in Irvine, I was a renter for 13 of them. And even though I'm a lawyer and my husband an educated professional, if it wasn't for him being a veteran and having access to the GI Bill, we would not have been able to afford a home in Irvine. I put myself through college and law school and like many young people had student loan debt to pay back. I believe the high cost of living in our state has a disproportionate impact on young families, working and middle class people. And I'm committed to addressing the housing crisis and bringing that missing middle housing to Irvine while still conforming to our unique village model. We need walkable schools and open spaces to remain. And that's why I'm the only Irvine candidate to have been endorsed by both the LAOC building trades as well as our state treasurer, Fiona Ma, who's had a tremendous impact on affordable housing in the state. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Thank you. And then our final candidate for the city of Irvine, I saw her on a minute ago, uh, Tammy Kim. <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, for having me here. So I'm Tammy Kim. I'm running for city council. Um, you know, our campaign is really an extension of the advocacy work that I've been doing for many years. So I've launched my campaign. It's been exactly a year ago, and I've been advocating to create a full um, spectrum of housing opportunities with the focus on expanding opportunities for our working families, for our teachers, for our police officers, for our fighter fighters, healthcare providers. Um, I'm a 16 year resident of Irvine and I'm also a finance commissioner. I moved to Irvine as a single mother um, when I was uh, vice president of talent acquisition for a Fortune 500 company. Um, I then founded a Irvine based nonprofit organization, which is now um, my main job and one of the main social service organizations serving the Asian American community here in Orange County. And some of our programs include community wellness, mental health programs, Medicaid enrollment, uh, language access, civic engagement, and cultural based programs. Um, 
And I'm running for Irvine City Council because I believe that our city needs to reflect and uphold a bold vision of an innovative city that is well planned and sustainable and that can support a high quality of life for all of our residents, not just a few. And, you know, first and foremost, um, with COVID right now, we really need to look at protecting, you know, from a housing perspective, we need to look at protecting our residents from future ev evictions and foreclosures. This is one thing that I'm actually really concerned about, um, that we're gonna see the ripple effects of this um, as time goes on. Um, and as a single mother and a founder of a nonprofit organization serving immigrant communities, I understand issues around affordable housing. Because over the past 15 years, this population has grown. The city has grown at a rate of 93%. And now renters make up the majority of our population. But housing inventory has still not grown at that same pace. Um, housing has actually become even more unaffordable. And I believe we need to create more housing opportunities at every income level. So I will just leave it at that and let you answer your questions. And thank you so much. And, and I hope to earn your support. Thank you. Okay, well, well, we'll start with you since we're going in reverse order this time with the questions. So like I said earlier, when I was talking to the two mayoral candidates, Irvine is a special city. We have the village community based on real estate and development. How would you continue to achieve the growth that you just mentioned a second ago that we need as both a state and, and, uh, and a city, um, but then also um, help with attainable home ownership for people who want to live in this amazing place? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, everyone becomes anti development in Irvine the moment they buy a house. Um, and so we, we, really need to uh, relook at, you know, our attitude when it comes to development. I'm not anti-development. What I am is I'm about sustainable development. And we need to uh, provide more opportunities for, um, uh, we have to recognize that Irvine is a job center. And so we have to do more to ensure that we've got housing at every level. We have to work with, our development partners, we have to work with the community stakeholders to ensure that we are providing access and opportunities at every income um, level and at the various spectrum. Um, we've got a, one of the things that I hear is that, um, you know, there's no opportunity to buy even a mid-level uh, home. And so in order to take advantage of educational opportunities here, um, you know, you either have to rent or you have to live um, in, you know, families of five or six in a one bedroom apartment. And so, you know, we really need to end this and we need to just provide these opportunities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren, same question for you. Do you need me to repeat it? No, that's okay. You're right. Irvine is a really unique city. I support more housing for teachers, veterans, police, and fire in our city. And I also su support us continuing inclusionary zoning as it works in our city. And it ensures that affordable housing fits the character of the community while also meeting the needs of our city. You know, Irvine also has a unique community land trust that allows us to bring more affordable housing for veterans and families in addition to that. And I'll just note that I do support cutting some of the red tape and streamlining projects that meet the requirements of the city and state so that we can get the housing that we need built. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and Diana? Hi, owning a home is the key to the American dream increase house uh, the home ownership builds community and drives our economy and uh, Irvine has a very good general plan this is uh, Irvine general plan housing elements it's about um, 120 pages so we have uh, several relative housing issues like uh, supply affordability density to increase housing supply, we should stick to our city general plan, which outlines urban's development goals. And uh, urban's general plan 
they provide different level of the housing supply to different level of the income. And the housing affordability improves if there's more of it. Building what we promise in our general plan will keep price more affordable and allow more housing density also reduce the price. We should explore converting the vacant commercial office because people will continue working from home when the pandemic has ended. That will preserve our existing neighborhoods. We should keep land use decision local, but we can also do that if we creative work together to address our housing needs. Thank you. And last but not least, Christina. Hi, okay. So um, can you totally repeat the question for me? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. I see that you changed your your hoodie and, and everything. Um, yeah, so no, my son, yeah, he, um, it's bedtime, so he kind of was being very fussy with the babysitter and he did not. Understood. So Ir Irvine is, like I said, a very special place with our village communities known for growth and development. How would you on the council help um, continue to make sure we had that growth of all levels of housing, um, but also help to make housing attainable? So I guess that's actually one of our biggest problems here in Irvine is that housing isn't really attainable. That American dream isn't something that everybody can see themselves getting here in Irvine because I definitely don't see myself getting it here in Irvine. Being a single mom and then having to afford, you know, childcare and then trying to afford somewhere to live, I'd be lucky if I could rent a room in somebody's house here in Irvine. Um, so we need to do a better job at making sure that our most vulnerable demographics and like the demographics that fall through the cracks regularly are looked after. It's not about being anti-development, it's about being pro-smart development. It's about being pro-beneficial with the development. Do you need unnecessary development right here in Irvine? No, we don't, but we also don't need development that's going to rob our citizens and rob our residents that, you know, I'm you know, not trying to say any names, but we're not trying to have, if we we trust the housing and these developments and to these developers, how do we trust that they're not going to turn around and then um, rip off our residents and then there we go again, repeating the cycle of affordable housing. I think it's something that we have to reach out to our developers and reach out um, because it's not just something you can solve single single handedly. It's you know there's a root problem for. Uh, that issue. And so it's about solving that root problem. I think reaching out to developers and working out issues and working out um, sustainable plans to, to achieve affordable housing and then enforcing affordable housing in the sense of if you are living in affordable housing, you shouldn't be driving around in BMWs or Tesla or the newest car every year unless you know it's a company car. And like if your company is affording to pay that kind of car, what your salary, you, you shouldn't be allowed to have all of these extra things and then trying to take advantage of affordable housing. I think that's something that comes down to money management. And that's something that a lot of people, you know, it's playing the system and every, you know, I think that's something that people need to keep a close eye on in that aspect of making sure it's not playing the system. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Christina and everyone in Irvine. That concludes my portion of the program. And I'm glad I got to stop um, with Irvine, because Elizabeth, you know that I think Irvine is just the best I place do. ever. I do know. Yes. Thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate your expertise and, and all the skills that you brought to this event and the event last week. So I'm really grateful. Um, we're going to let Brian go. We're going to take like a one minute break. If you need to get up, get a drink of water, and we will be back at, I'm going to say we're going to be back at 7.02 with Ryan A. of City Ventures and also of People for Housing. So take a stretch, we'll be right back. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can I confirm with you that you can hear me now? Hello, can anyone hear me? Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Let's get started with the second half of our event. Uh, Ryan, um, yeah, Ryan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the event tonight. Um, I'm really passionate about housing and housing production, and uh, I think this is just a really important discussion to, to lead with uh, leaders in South County. 
So there's uh, six, cities, six cities left. Um, five of them are in South County, and then for some reason, Orange is also uh, in our uh, discussion tonight. And uh, I'm just going to have uh, my picture up tonight. I'm having some video issues, so you're just going to see me, I think, in the last time that I wore a tie. Um, so we will start with Laguna Hills, and our first uh, candidate is Nick Wood. Hi, everyone. Nick Wood, a candidate for Laguna Hills City Council. It's nice to meet everyone virtually. Um, just really quick about myself. Uh, my family's been in the Laguna Hills area for almost 60 years now, so long before it was Laguna Hills. Uh, it's been a few things since then. Um, I have three kids, love the area. I settled in here permanently six years ago and love taking part in the community and making this my long-term home. Now, affordable housing is something I support in a big way. And I have a background that supports the um, forward movement of the affordable housing um, uh, capacities and you know, building projects that we can create in California. I um, started out, uh, you know, I grew up with a zoning attorney father. So you know, pretty much spent my summers helping him out. I did a lot of canvassing of the community and things like that. And instead of going into law, I actually went into business. And for um, uh, the business side of it, the background with being able to canvass the community for building, zoning, and development projects really came in handy. Um, because most of the business development I did was heavy, heavy environmental impact. I worked for Marathon Oil in the Midwest. Um, I worked up in San Francisco, launching one of the first uh, nitrogen ice cream companies. And if you've ever, you know, dealt with something like environmental, you know, showing up in Berkeley and telling someone, you know, that we're going to have a 2,000 gallon nitrogen tank in their backyard, you know, will take you another six months of meeting with the community. Now, having said that, that is the way that we get these developments to happen is meeting with the community and having the community involved because as I was canvassing our community, you know, I got a lot of different feedback because this issue, there's not a lot of people in the middle. It's very polarizing. It isn't like, oh, hey, I want some low income and I don't know. It's like either I do or I don't. And the concerns were pretty intense. And what it seemed very obviously is that public education is the number one thing that we can do to make these projects happen. Uh, I have a big digital marketing background, which will come in handy in that process uh, with the current you know, situation we have in the world with lockdowns and COVID-19 and things like that. Um, but that's what I would do to help be able to push this forward is use my background to get out there, do the feed on the street, talk to the people, find out you know, how they want, what they want. Um, because I believe if we're gonna be welcoming you know, the, the people that need these things to our community, the community has to be involved because we are a community. And when they do come to our community, they should be well, they should be feel welcome. Um, you know, they should feel wanted. And as we know, even if it was a government decision, the community won't direct their negativity towards the government for making those decisions. They'll direct it at the residents of the low income housing. And that is something we cannot allow. And we prevent that through community education. All right. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for that. Um, you're the only candidate tonight uh, for Laguna Hill, so I'll ask you um, the follow-up question just direct. Yeah, um, absolutely. So a, lot, a lot of cities in Orange County um, have kind of enacted some housing programs, and then there was a backlash from local community groups that have kind of uh, enacted uh, housing moratoriums, housing unit caps, other types of ballot box zoning measures. Um, mm -hmm. Those are all barriers to new development. Uh, how do you view those tactics? You know, would you stand up against such proposals within your city? I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. What we're looking to do, and again, I believe that we can overcome those hurdles with direct community involvement. Um, when, you know, we're meeting our, we have our housing and development quotas, obviously, and our quota jumped quite a bit from this year to next year, um, roughly about 1,200 units, which I believe 20% of those are required to be low-income housing. Um, now, when the time comes, you know, if there's going to be pushback, that is something I'll absolutely stand up for is, hey, we need to develop this. Let's get together. A thousand heads are better than one. This is our community. We're all involved in this. How do we make this happen in a way that everybody can be happy with and the new members of our community can feel welcome? Great. Well, thanks so much, Nick. Um, now we're moving on to Laguna Niguel. Thank you. 
five uh, candidates that are participating tonight. So this is, uh, for my portion, this is our largest group. Um, the first candidate is uh, Stephanie uh, Addo. Is that, is that the correct pronunciation? It's Otto. But, Otto, I'm sorry. But thank you for being fancy. I appreciate that. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Stephanie Otto, and I'm running for Laguna Niguel City Council. I moved to Laguna Niguel with my husband and two kids in 2010. My son's now a senior in high school and my daughter is a sophomore. So I'm gonna be an empty nester soon. Um, but before moving to Laguna Niguel, I served on the Bel Air Florida Town Council, elected in 2007 and reelected in 2009. And there I was appointed by the county to the Pinellas Planning Council to represent six cities in a county of almost a million people. I also served on both the town and the county historic preservation boards. When I'm talking to residents here in Laguna Niguel, and a lot of the reasons why I love Laguna Niguel, um, you know, we love our open space here and our parks, and um, we like our generally quiet city and our low traffic uh, compared to other Orange County cities. But um, on balance, the county has a homelessness problem. Um, we know affordable housing can help that. And we also uh, have a need for multiple types of affordable housing. So in Laguna Niguel, we need more housing for entry level buyers. And as I mentioned, my kids are gonna go away to college and I want them to be able to come back and be financially independent uh, adults. Um, the city has met its RENA requirements this last cycle, but we do uh, have in our next housing cycle an estimate of making about a thousand units of affordable housing available. Um, we need to meet those requirements so that the state doesn't take away our planning power at both the city council level and the planning commission levels. Uh, but I believe we can keep and maintain our great way of life here in Laguna Niguel by also meeting the state mandate and building this housing in a way that fits in our community. And as council member, member I will include our residents in the community from the concept stage of a project and be diligent about communi communicating with our residents. I look forward to your question. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. So we're gonna go through all of the candidates in Laguna Niguel, and then we'll ask the question and then they'll answer it in reverse order. So next um, is Sandy Raines. Uh, good evening and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Sandy Raines and I'm currently serving on the Laguna Niguel City Council. It's been my honor to serve Laguna Niguel the past two years. As a first generation American who's lived and experienced the American dream, as well as home ownership, I know the importance of creating opportunities for future development and sustainability of our communities. I am the owner of a real estate investment company that invests in areas that are underserved and redevelops housing to create a tenable housing for all. I have the business experience and understand the need for quality policy makers that can work with our development communities. During my tenure, our city was one of only 29 California cities that achieved its RENA requirements. Serving on the ACCOC Housing Committee has helped me understand creative ways communities are creating housing while maintaining the quality and integrity of their cities. In addition, I voted to approve one of the first new housing projects in Laguna Niguel in decades. It was not easy. <laughs> As the mother of a disabled daughter, I know and understand the systemic issues associated with homelessness. More than 70% of our homeless family of residents suffer from mental, developmental, or physical disabilities. This cannot continue. Advocating for supportive housing and identifying the needs of our most vulnerable residents will be a key to our success as a county and as each city. The key to creating strong communities in ed is education, and information as well as a transparent government. I have always taken the time to listen and to understand while meeting the needs of my community and I look forward to serving Laguna Niguel for the next four years. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks Sandy. Um, next from Laguna Niguel is Rishi Paul Sharma. Very good, thank you. Uh, my name is Rishi Paul Sharma. I'm a candidate for Laguna Niguel Council. Uh, personally, I'm a father of four children, seven, five, three, and one. I'm a 13-year resident of Laguna Niguel. I have been active in my community over the last decade. Uh, professionally, I'm a certified financial professional with over 25 years of business experience owning my own firm and specializing in pension uh, planning. Uh, my involvement in the community includes, I'm a, I'm a, a 
I'm on the Chamber of Commerce or in the Chamber of Commerce. I'm a member of the Lions Club, the Rotary as well. And I've served for 11 plus years on our homeowners association as past and current president. Um, I'm also on the city level, the current chair of the investment banking and audit committee for the city of Laguna Niguel, and also a volunteer on the military support committee for our city. Uh, everything has been extremely um, fulfilling as far as my engagement, my involvement with the community, the people, and my involvement in running for city council is really to just give back to our city. Uh, one thing that people don't know about me as they're meeting me is when I first moved to California, I lived out of my car for a short period of time. So I have firsthand experience of what it's like to not have a house. Fast forward 25 years now, I have a house. I have actually multiple homes for my family and we have a wonderful life together. But what I would like to see in Laguna Niguel is an opportunity for entry level homes be developed as well as mid range homes. You know, it is very challenging for families that are just starting out to be able to afford a residence and have stability to raise their children in. And that's something that I strive for every day with my family. Thanks, Rishi. Um, we have one more candidate on the list. Um, Michael Fair, are you on? I don't see Michael's face in the crowd here. Um, Go ahead and move on, it's no problem. Okay, yep, we'll move on. So um, the question that I had for the, I guess the three Laguna Niguel candidates that are participating, um, you know, the city has done a tremendous job. You met your fifth cycle arena numbers. You built hundreds of apartments in the gateway specific plan area. Um, and now you have, you know, these um, middle-class renters that are financially stable. And if they want to purchase a home and, and stay in your community, um, you know, as, as Rishi had mentioned, there's, there's barriers to entry. Um, how will you specifically encourage and support entry level home ownership opportunities in your city? And uh, since Rishi went last, you'll answer this question first. Very good. Um, so Laguna Niguel is a member of the Orange County Housing Trust. It helps us develop and create affordable housing in Laguna Niguel. And what I would submit to you is when I say affordable housing or entry level, you know, there's a disparity between coming into an apartment and having to try to afford a $1.2 million home, especially when you're on in, in a minimum wage job or, you know, barely making ends meet in California. So beyond just being able to develop the properties, we have to be able to create a structure in which individuals can work and transition to housing within Laguna Niguel. And what I would submit for consideration is that we need to really concentrate our, on our infrastructure build. It's not just a matter of building homes. We have to develop the city alongside that. Thanks so much. Um, Sandy, do you need me to re repeat the question or do you have it? No, I, I think um, um, being able to achieve this goal is one of the, the biggest challenges that many cities face. However, I think here in Laguna de Gallo, we have, many, uh, we have continued our gateway project product, which is um, obviously not for home ownership. It is zoned for um, rental. We do have other areas in our community that are uh, open for home ownership, and one could be in our uh, Ziggurat building area, which is about ready to come available, and that's about 93 acres. All of the property surrounding the Ziggurat, the 93 acres, is also been there for a while and can be redeveloped. There's opportunities for creating housing and going up, and there's also opportunities for home ownership, whether it's a condo that you start with and then move into a home. It is true that the average medium income of a, of a home here in California is, um, here in Laguna Niguel is almost a million dollars. So we do need to work with our regional partners. So we have uh, Habitat for Humanity, which would be a great partner that we could work with. And I've met with them and they do, they do a wonderful job of providing that type of attainable housing for families, which is amazing. And then we have other regional partners who are also willing to work with us and so that's, that's the key, I think, is uh, partnering with those regional partners, making sure that we are aware of the opportunities that are available to us and having the political will to educate and inform our community on what that really means. I think our community would be open to home ownership more than rentals. So I think we have a, a good place to move forward with. Thank you. 
Great, thanks, Andy. And then Stephanie, um, it's your turn. Hi. Did you, did you yeah. Uh, no, I think I, I think I got it. Um, you know, when I the first home that I ever bought was a townhome, um, and it, it's still our favorite house to to this date. Um, the layout was nice. I, I couldn't hear my neighbors between the walls. And um, so uh, that's a great entry level house. Um, and I think there's ways to encourage um, mixed development uh, uh, in, in some of these areas like the Ziggurat. Um, our city center has some um, townhomes slated. So those kind of entry home, doing the mixed development and encouraging the builder to do that, to work with our community again, to educate them and be transparent. Thank you. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so that wraps up Laguna Niguel. We're gonna just go across the five freeway uh, into Mission Viejo. We have one candidate tonight and that's Pauline Hale. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me? I've been having audio issues. Sounds good. Awesome. I am a 21 year Mission Viejo homeowner. I chose Mission Viejo as my home when I moved here from LA County. I have 25 years of commercial real estate consulting experience and um, I'm the crew commercial real estate women Orange County philanthropy chair and we partner with Chrysalis and Wise Place. Both organizations are in the trenches of our housing affordability crisis. So um, my exposure in real estate, my exposure with my philanthropy work, I think um, really helped me understand um, what's going on. Um, and somebody mentioned in the um, chat the lack of diversity relative to the North Orange County panel. Um, I just wanted to point out that I am an LGBTQ plus Jewish female, so I may not show my diversity, but it's 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 well in, ingrained in me. Um, I think here in Mission Viejo, I think one of the issues we have is I think education is key in my community. I feel there's a lot of misunderstanding around workforce and community and affordable housing. Um, you know, workforce housing is 80 to 120,000, 80 to 120% of AMI and everything I looked at said that AMI per HUD for this part of Orange County is $103,000. Um, that means anyone making less than $6,400 a month is overburdened um, with rent um, relative to income. And that means almost 60% of the renters in Mission Viejo are overburdened. Um, and these are our teachers and nurses of our two biggest employers, Mission Hospital and Saddleback College. And not to mention the people who I hear complain about still having their adult children at home. Um, those are the people that, that should know that affordable and workforce housing is good for the community. And it's not, I mean, there is, there's a place and a need for supportive housing, but I think people automatically think we're going to start housing homeless people in you know in integrated within our communities um, one of the other things that comes up with the uh, NIMBYs is you know the complaints about density oh we're gonna have density 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 it doesn't really eat and they say it makes more traffic if people could live where they work Mission Hospital Salback College um, there would be less traffic because people there's no immigration during the daytime it stops clogging up all that stuff that's happening on Oso and La Paz and Crown Valley, you know, and this affects, you know, all of my neighbors because we've all got the same arterial streets that we're dealing with. Um, and just, a, you know, a few things about what's going on in Mission Viejo. Um, the city spent $13 million to buy the Casa del Sol golf course. Um, and that was partially influenced by NIMBYs who wanted to um, avoid density in housing. And then there's a current project at Los Lisos and the 241. It's a Shea project. It's 105 units, only 16 of which are affordable. And it's in an underperforming strip mall that had like no tenants in it. And the NIMBYs opposed it um, because the density and they wanted more open space. Now, anyone who's a f familiar with Mission Viejo knows we have plenty of open space. And um, you know, it, was, it was in the city charters that we have, you know, park per per person kind of situation so that's my thoughts um i think it's education down here in south county because i think there's this you know big bad monster feeling about affordable and workforce housing and it's our teachers and our nurses and our police officers and our firefighters and 
all of those people who can't afford to live in the city where they work. And that's my thoughts. All right. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, you, know, you definitely articulated your view on, on kind of why, you know, housing is needed. Um, you know, as uh, someone in the development community that's proposing housing, you know, in various infill locations across the region, we often run into um, issues where NIMBYs uh, utilize social media to amplify uh, the voice of opponents to new housing. Um, you know, what strategies would you use to assure that proposed developments are given fair consideration and they're not kind of drowned out by the, the vocal uh, minority? Um, I think it all starts with the reason I'm running for Mission Viejo City Council is to have a voice on the City Council that thinks more like I do. Our um, City Council is very homogenous. It's been the same 10 people in the five seats for the 21 years I've lived here, give or take a person or two, one of which was recalled. So I think if our community could speak up about what they need and what they want, um, in a public forum rather than on social media because some people that's their only option right now you go to a city council meeting and if you don't kind of go with the status quo you're shut down um, and I've seen that myself in person and I've kind of watched it from the background so um, and you know I know developers I, I worked with them for 25 years and I know we can make it work I know we can get the people to understand um, the need for housing if we just have some education Great. Well, thank you so much, Pauline. Um, that wraps it up for Mission Viejo. We're going to kind of go back up the five into orange into the second district race. And our first candidate there is Martin Verona. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Martin Verona. I'm running for Orange uh, City Council in District 2. Uh, my hometown of Orange uh, has been outpacing our neighboring cities. Uh, in terms of housing costs, and it's only really getting worse. The, the call for affordable housing has never been greater, uh, especially now. Uh, we should all want affordable housing in our neighborhoods. And handling the situation of affordable housing is inextricably linked with, uh, with the crises of our time, like, um, like labor wages and climate change and land use, just to name a few. But without sufficient housing, we, we drive further, uh, we have to like drive further out to, uh, to our jobs, creating mental and physical health problems for, for commuters and increasing the negative impact on that our car dependency has on our climate, which is made worse by our lack of investment in alternative forms of transportation. Um, I'm a civil engineer with transportation and traffic engineering experience. And it's, tr it's, it's very troubling to see this lack of political will and empathy to our local income communities by not creating more housing um, which would open the doors to making walking, bicycling, and transit more viable and create more stable families and communities, which I think we, we all want. If we significantly reduce our car use and we don't need as many parking spaces and lots, we could free up valuable land uh, that could be used up for open spaces and housing, more housing. Uh, that's just a bit of my vision that I hope to set in motion if I'm elected into city council, Orange City Council. I'm passionate about this because I've lived uh, some difficult experiences uh, when looking for the cheapest housing available uh, with my family, spending too much on rent. And even during the Great Recession, my family couldn't keep up with uh, the payments for their mortgage. And uh, when we finally were able to afford a house and we lost it. So with that, with those particular experiences, <clears throat> these moments, along with my education and roots with the working class communities in Orange, uh, I'll be a staunch opponent or proponent <laughs> for affordable housing and uh, seek protections for our communities. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, we have one other candidate from Orange that's on the list, but I'm not seeing uh, Caroline in the, uh, the room here. So I think we'll just uh, ask Martin the, the follow-up question direct. Um, uh, housing overcrowding, which is you know, too many people living in a home is a concern. Uh, in particular during this pandemic, um, how would you explain to your constituents the difference between uh, housing overcrowding and higher density housing? How would I explain the difference? Um, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough because um, I think there's already preconceptions of what 
certain housing is kind of it's been mentioned already before um and honestly it's going to be a very difficult conversation and there's really no easy way to go about it um there's there has to be conversations about why our communities look the way they are why we've made choices that we've made in the past uh, and that's why you know our communities look the way they are because we don't invest enough in our um in our communities in affordable housing and the, these are things these past decisions are things that have um created the issue of uh cr crowding in housing uh these are these are different issues they're, they're they come from different places multifamily housing are is not overcrowding everybody has a place to live everyone is living with dignity um i've done uh, i've experienced a bit of housing overcrowding it has nothing to do with uh with you know affordable housing it has to, or should I, I should say it has to do with not being able to find uh, the appropriate opportunities uh it's there's not enough housing that's the issue there's they're almost completely opposite in the sense that one there's a lack of housing and one you have enough housing for someone to live in so um these are difficult issues because someone had mentioned earlier the the interests of homeowners um basically are are opposed to uh to to, to creating multiple to multifamily housing because it it might be able it might negatively impact their um their the values of their home but that's the situation we're in right now the way i see it uh the the value of their homes are increasing on the backs of working class communities who have to travel further away who have to um experience all the different difficulties that come with um with not living in the communities and not being able to afford a home. Great. Thanks, Martin. Um, so that, that, that wraps up Orange. Next, we're going to move down to Rancho Santa Margarita, and our candidate is Beth Schwartz. Hi, thank you all for having me tonight. I feel like I've found my people. I am so excited to be running for RSM as a nurse, a pastor, and a professor. I am one of those nurses that Pauline was talking about just up the street from her community in Mission Viejo who hopes to bring a different forward thinking perspective to Rancho Santa Margarita. Same as our community, a lot of the same, a lot of the status quo, and I am tired of it. I am a nurse that works on the COVID-19 homeless team for the County of Orange. And so every day I am, I am working in and amongst our community departments, such as mentioned in the chat tonight, Illumination Foundation. I'm working with Mercy House. I'm working with many shelters and nonprofits to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And so my two passions, combine and collide when we talk about affordable housing and the opportunity to uh, work with our homeless community. I am someone who moved from the greater Philadelphia area and sold a big, not big, I should say a moderate size home on a wooded property. And we here after five years in Rancho Santa Margarita cannot get into the market as a family of four, working class, middle class people. It's unsustainable for my children and grandchildren to live here, which I think is appalling for public servants and anyone, anyone who's helping and serving in our community. And so I just wanna bring a different voice. I wanna understand and acknowledge the complexities that RSM is facing. It's a built community. It is a community that doesn't have multiple areas that we can um, create new development, but we can you do mixed use. We are looking at all of the options around the Dove Canyon rezoning process. And what does that look like? How do we continue to create communities that have the space and, and can be reimagined when some of our older um, construction doesn't, doesn't fit anymore? So I'm not going to look away. I'm going to bring the elements of homelessness to the community. I'm going to talk about how do we at least contribute to a shelter? How do we contribute and work towards caring for the people that are homeless in our community? I'm not going to look away and I'm going to bring that to them. I want creative, sustainable solutions. Thanks for letting me speak. Thanks, Beth. Um, so the follow-up question I have, um, could you share your thoughts on how you would navigate the tension between the need for housing at all income levels and the negative connotations that some people associate with affordable housing? 
Absolutely. And so that's where I think bringing the humanity, bringing the element of story, bringing people to the table of all different demographics, currently our current incumbents, they just want more of the same. And, and they have had that ability for upwards of 20 years. And so it's time that people are brought to the table. We have forums, we can have listening circles, we can understand what it's like to live in this community if we haven't been able to get into the housing market. And I want to share what it's like as a COVID-19 nurse navigating shelters to help bring a level of gratitude and uh, responsibility to serve those less vulnerable, those that may not be at the same level, but are vulnerable populations. Thanks so much, Beth. Uh, we have one last city for tonight's discussion, and that is the uh, southernmost city in Orange County, San Clemente. Um, we're going to start, we have uh, four candidates, um, and I think there's a couple different races, but we're just going to kind of um, bundle the candidates together and, and just do the one follow-up question. Um, the first candidate is uh, Zen Wu. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, my name is Zen Wu. I'm a licensed architect and certified planner. I have worked on land planning for most uh, developed personal home builders in Orange County. It, it's, it's a, yeah. The volume's a little light. You may want to get a little closer to your microphone. Since 2015 to present, I have served on planning commission and a design review subcommittee. Just last night, I had a, a joint meeting with city council to review our inclusionary housing program. We're also considering a lot consolidation ordinance to provide additional incentives to affordable housing on top of the state density bonus. The city has been built out. We have a deficit of uh, over 200 units now. So the new unit number is much higher, so we have a lot of work to do in the coming years. I've always been a supporter to housing in general, especially to, uh, to affordable housing. The initiative I will make as a council member is review of our affordable housing overlay development standards and a reform of our in lieu fee calculation to make them work. To offset the financial burden to home builders, I will look into reducing parking requirements and a possibility of upzoning our commercial corridors, such as Avenida Pico, to promote uh, mixed use developments. Lastly, I will uh, closely work with our neighboring cities and counties to seek a regional solution to the homeless issue. Many years ago, I worked on a transitional housing project in Juno Park called Hope, Hope Family Housing, and I learned the concept of a continuum of care. I'm encouraged by the resources provided by the state on home key and uh, other emergency funding programs, and I wanna be a ready and a willing participant towards a solution of the homeless issue. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, the next candidate in San Clemente is Donna Verdreen. Good evening. My name is Donna Verdreen and I'm on the ballot for a two-year term for San Clemente City Council November 3rd. I'm a registered nurse for 40 years and a legal nurse consultant with the background in managing businesses and hospital departments. I'm qualified to bring my experience as a military officer, seasoned manager, and public health advocate to serve San Clemente. I have a Bachelor of Science in Nursing and a Master's degree in Health Services Management. I will address our city's homelessness crisis head on with prevention and intervention to keep families and individuals off the street. As an elected official, I will work for solutions to end homelessness, increase opportunities for affordable housing, grow middle-class jobs in San Clemente. As an elected leader, I will work to partner with nonprofits to provide emergency shelter with case management in San Clemente, leading to permanent supportive housing, leading to affordable housing, supporting full range of housing opportunities. Streamline the permitting process, facilitate the approval process, rezone areas to facilitate a diverse community of multifamily housing. Facilitate small business development in San Clemente, making it possible for middle, for middle class families to move and live here. 
My priorities include supportive housing and food security for our people of San Clemente. I want to be a unifying voice for San Clemente. Uh, I ask for your endorsement, your vote, and your financial support for my election cam campaign. I want to take the initiative and lead, not just, um, not just lead when it's safe. And it is the time to lead and to act, not to review. And that's how I feel, and that's why I'm running for city council to have a voice. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank the next you. candidate that we have is George Gregory. Can't hear George. George, do you have a, do, did you dial in by audio? Did you dial in on the phone for your audio? We can't hear you. Okay, let's go to the next candidate, Chris. And George, if you want to call in on audio, you can do that through the phone. Okay, um, so we'll move on to Chris and then you know, we'll try to circle back to George. Uh, so our next candidate is Chris Duncan. All right. Good, uh, good evening to uh, all three of you who are still with us here. Thanks for, uh, for hanging in there. Uh, enjoy uh, the opportunity to hear everybody and, and uh, hopefully can bring this home tonight. Uh, Chris Duncan running for San Clemente City Council. I, uh, I'm running for one of the, uh, the four year full term spots. Uh, I live in San Clemente with my wife and three young children. I'm on the, the school site council at their elementary school. Uh, I was a, an attorney for the Department of Homeland Security actually until Recently, um, I left because uh, some of the policies went against my, my values, including caging children. And uh, so I will bring that interest in standing up for vulnerable people to my city. Uh, San Clemente is an aging city. We need housing for young, younger generations, low-income families and seniors. Those vulnerable people form the backbone and future of our city. They often don't have a, an advocate on council, though I would be that advocate. As, as mentioned, uh, San Clemente is built out. It's a challenging city to, to foster affordable housing in, uh, but we can do it. I live in the Telega neighborhood, home of Jamboree's flagship affordable housing community, Mendocino. Uh, I volunteered at Mendocino. I've witnessed firsthand uh, how important and beneficial stable housing is for those low-income families. You know, in the affordable housing debate, we often forget, uh, we focus so much on the numbers and hit, trying to hit these numbers. We forget about the people that we're trying to house and just how important uh, that housing is to, to their growth and their opportunity to, to fully enjoy the community and to be productive members of the community. Uh, now, Mendocino is important. Uh, it's an important example because it's fully integrated into the larger community. Most people don't even know it's there. That's the, that's the beauty of it. And the folks that live there are, uh, you know, are an active and, and integral part of our community. So we have a success story in San Clemente we can build on. I think we need to think outside of the box because of those structural challenges. And those might include raising in our in lieu fees, using them strategically to in incentivize developers to rehabilitate our classic San Clemente buildings uh, into mixed use and workforce housing in our commercial corridors so they support our local businesses as well. And uh, we should also look at fully resourcing our plan planning, engineering and building divisions so that when permits come in, they're processed expeditiously and those projects can move forward quickly. Thanks for your time and appreciate uh, the question that's coming. Thanks, Chris. Um, so let's, let's try George again. Do we have any audio? I think the issue is that he didn't use the Zoom audio. He either is trying to dial in or he's, um, there's no mic or he chose to use the phone on Zoom. So I'm not quite sure how to help him. I put the, I put the phone number in there, but I'm afraid we're down to the wire for time. So, um, well, I'll, I'll work with him offline. I, I apologize. I thought this was clear. Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll kind of ask the follow-up question to the, to the other candidates. And then if we can get George's um, audio working, then we can uh, uh, bring him into the conversation as well. Um, so we'll start with Chris. Um, the question um, is related to the RENA uh, process. 
Um, almost every city in California um, is, is kind of falling behind on their state mandated housing goals uh, through this uh, RENA cycle. Um, the goals are, uh, are, are, are pretty challenging. Uh, do you see these as targets, these RENA targets as realistic or aspirational and why? And what would you, what will you do to ensure that your city is not behind in permitting new housing? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, particularly for San Clemente. We are behind. We have failed to hit our numbers or really even come close. And unfortunately, the prospects don't look good. Um, now, the, the tension we have here is how do you encourage more building but not put such onerous requirements on, uh, it, you know, in order you know, to, to get affordable housing that you discourage the development that you're seeking? Uh, I do think we need to revisit that. that in fact, uh, Mr. Wu had mentioned that the planning session that just happened, that was the main topic. They have, we have a, a contractor that's, that we're working with to try to think up those new options. Um, I think we can do it. We need to, again, think outside of the box. We should think aspirationally, though. We should not, we should not just throw in the towel. Some of our, our structure has actually inhibited the, hitting those targets. I think we've sort of made a showing of, of oh, we're going to try and do this, but the way that we've structured it has, has, has been counterproductive. Because we, you know, without getting into the details, you know, we, we've, we've made it such that it's almost impossible for this housing to come in. So we need to look at not, not so much focusing just on low, low housing, which is where we've been. Look at the mixed use, look at the workforce. So make it more uh, beneficial for the developers to, uh, to build housing in those areas. Um, but we should think big. And uh, we're, we're San Clemente, we can do that. We have a history of success in this area as long as we uh, we think of some creative solutions, and that, that largely includes, to me, rehabilitating existing buildings so that it looks and feels like San Clemente, but we have new housing in those areas. Thanks, Chris. Um, Donna, do you need me to repeat the question, or um, you're still on mute? Okay. Go ahead, and go. go ahead and repeat the question, please. Sure. Um, so it's related to the RENA uh, um, process. Um, do you see San Clemente's uh, RENA targets as realistic or aspirational and why? And what would you do to ensure that your city is not behind in permitting new housing? I don't think San Clemente has um, the right goals, the right numbers. I don't think the leadership has been there to set the bar to where we need to go. We are built out and that's understandable, but we need to look at housing options and how to make housing affordable. So we can look at, at rezoning zones. We have recently um, done some rezoning for the ADUs, um, but that's just a, uh, a tiny step. We need to look for rezoning for multiple family dwellings. We need to find housing and have a plan and make it happen. We should look at subsidized housing. Um, we need inclusionary zoning. Uh, we need to um, engage the community. I sometimes believe that the community is more engaged and educated than the leadership right now in our city government. So we need to uh, vote people into office that are passionate about this and that are leaders and can uh, do community engagement and education, work with the planning commission, work with the state, work with the county and achieve the goals where we need to be um, in San Clemente. We have a lot of work to do and San Clemente is always, well, let's look and see what our sister cities can do. And let's look and see what the county should do for us, what the state should do for us. We need to look at San Clemente. We need to address homelessness, affordable housing in San Clemente and take the leadership role instead of, um, looking for other other cities, other counties in the state to solve our problems. Thanks, Donna. And let's try to go back to George one more time. Do we work out the audio? Mm. Well, I think the same issue remains, which is that the mic on his computer is either not working or he chose a different uh, 
setting. source because there's just no audio at all. So I apologize. I'll work with them offline to try to make sure we find a way to include his message. Okay. Um, so then I, I think our, uh, our final uh, um, response is, is uh, from Zen. Uh, so uh, do you need to repeat the question or? No, no, I got the question. Um, the reader number, current, our current reader number is a 581. Uh, we're, we're in deficit of a 212. Starting from next year for the sixth cycle, the new number is expected to be 975. Doesn't seem too bad to comparing to some other cities, which has a much higher number. But for a built environment like Saint Clement, it's a challenge, it's aspirational. But we can we can try to achieve it. Um, the the Mendocino project uh, in Talega was completed in 2003. After that, there was three projects completed. Each of them is less than 100 units. Two of them are senior housing. And just one project is affordable for, for families. Uh, we're talking about affordable housing apartments. So um, the, I think the state gradually takes away some local control from the cities to provide ADU, which is a nice thing. Uh, we usually like to have local control, but in that particular area, um, not having a local control is provided some political cover. So we're looking forward to uh, use ADU to fulfill some of the reader number, especially on moderate income and above moderate income. But for the low income and very low income, ADU is not going to, going to qualify. Our current Inlufi program is outdated. Uh, we charge, um, um, our goal is 4% of the unit, which is lower than a lot of other cities. And typically they're about 10 15% of affordable units requirement. Uh, our, our fee is about 1% of construction cost, which is, which is much lower. So the, the re what happened is every builder, they choose to pay the new fee uh, instead of uh, building them on site. So that has to be fixed to make these options imperative. And then the city can start tweaking uh, the program to favor one way or another. Um, so, uh, Overall, it is a challenge, but I think um, by, by revamping our affordable housing um, overlay, um, we, can, we can get a little more. The affordable housing overlay in St. Clement produced uh, two affordable units over many years. It, it apparently, it doesn't work. So and the biggest thing we can look at is the parking, parking issue, uh, parking requirement. And also by converting some of the commercial corridor, uh, such as the uh, Avenida Pico, to mix the use, um, and we can we can take advantage of those underutilized commercial zones into mix the use, mix the use zone, and give them a little more density, and hopefully that can, we can we can add some affordable units there. And then in the future, planning area eight, which is currently outside of San Clemente, but Rancho um, uh, Mission Viejo is trying to develop. Um, it's it's in the future. We don't know when it's going to happen, but hopefully that area provide enough opportunity because eventually Saint Clemente will incorporate that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think, Elizabeth, I will uh, hand it back to you to okay. wrap things up. Thank you so much, Brian. I, or Ryan, sorry. <laughs> um, I really am grateful for your, your expertise and your, your serving as our moderator for tonight. Um, I want to make one quick announcement. Um, as, as the evening wore on, we took a lesson learned from our North Orange County event, which was that we had left our panelists in the panelist category, even after they had been speaking and we had some breakthrough audio. So for this event, once the uh, candidates were done speaking, we moved them over to the attendee list um, so that we didn't get that interference. So I just wanted to be really clear that um, I don't want you to think that your candidates, uh, you know, spoke and then left. Many of them remained on the whole time, but we just moved them over to sort of avoid the audio issue that we had had on our first night. Um, and I'm really sorry to George in San Clemente that we weren't able to get um, your audio working, but uh, let's talk offline and, and I will, we're going to do a follow-up uh, email and blog post, so I'd, I'd welcome to give you some space if you'd like to share some thoughts. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I know we are all here because we care about the issue of housing and housing production. 
Um, again, I wanna thank my co-host organizations, uh, the Business Council, the BIA, uh, the California Apartment Association, um, everyone who helped me get the word out about this event, um, Habitat for Humanity, SCAMF, Kennedy Commission, um, and just all the stakeholders who really are committed to seeing more housing opportunities in Orange County. Um, you can learn more about our organization on our website, peopleforhousing.org, the word F-O-R, not the number. Um, we, we survive and uh, do this work on a combination of grants and donations and, and uh, volunteer. I have seven volunteer leaders who serve with me um, and a, a board of people who help us with fundraising, but we are always in need of uh, your support. So if you feel that we have done a good job, hit us up, make a donation, peopleforhousing.org. And uh, thank you. I really appreciate everyone's time and effort. And this has been great. This has been a, a real, it's been an accomplishment for us to get it, to get it done because this is the first time we've done this. And it has been, um, it would not have happened with all of, without all of your participation. So we're really grateful. And uh, we have all your email addresses. So we'll be in touch and we'll get the video up and, and get the links out to you soon. So thanks everybody. Grateful for your time tonight. Thank you. Ryan, and thanks to all the candidates for participating. You guys made this event what it is. So really grateful. Good night, everybody.